Good evening. We have only one question tonight, and it is of utmost importance, this question and answer. And if correctly understood, will explain the second step in this development and unfolding of transcendental consciousness. If crops grow irrespective of whether we are good or bad, can you explain the crop failures as mentioned in the Bible? Yes, and the crop failures as they are mentioned today also. To begin with, crops are not material. There is no such thing as a material potato or carrot or tomato. Everything that exists is a product of consciousness. Consciousness is the infinite, the all. Consciousness is God. Consciousness is the basic substance, cause, law, unto all effect. And therefore, consciousness is the primal cause, the primal essence, out of which all else emanates. Consciousness is made manifest as the consciousness of individual you and me, but it is not confined to you or me since it is infinite and is, of course, the consciousness of all men, all beings. exists is the image and likeness of the consciousness from which it came forth. And since consciousness is spirit, all that exists is spiritual. It is because of this that we read in the first chapter of Genesis that the crops were in the ground before the seeds were planted that there was light before the sun was in the sky. In other words, God's universe was created in the beginning not by material processes. God's creation was an emanation of his own being, an expression of his own being, or if it's more clearly understandable, its own being, since consciousness is not a male, consciousness is not a female. Consciousness is pure spiritual being. It is for this reason that eventually, when you realize who I am, you will understand why you are neither male nor female that you are manifesting in or through or as a male or female body, but that this body is not you. You are not a body, and a body is not you. Therefore, you are not male or female, though your body assumes the male or female form. But you are beyond the male and the female, you are that which is both male and female as God is. For you are one with God, an emanation of God, the manifestation of God's own being. In fact, you are God in infinite individual manifestation. And your body 
is the temple through which you are living this particular life. But as this life ends, that is, the human span, never believe for a moment that you are going to be buried in a tomb or placed into a crematory oven. You will never be there. Only that which is called your body, your concept of a vehicle, but not you. You will continue to exist as individual being, invisible to human sense, except to those humans who have what is sometimes called second sight or second vision, those who are enabled to perceive the invisible. Now, this, of course, is part of the controversy as to the truth or not truth of Christianity. Did anyone see the risen Jesus? Did Jesus rise from a tomb? Did he walk the earth? You see, this is one of the basic conditions of accepting Christianity, that you believe that Jesus was crucified, entombed, rose from the tomb, and walked the earth. If you do not believe it, it is because you do not have the spiritual vision that, is a, that would enable you to see that which the eyes cannot see and hear that which the ears cannot hear. In other words, you do not have the transcendental consciousness but are in the material state of consciousness because the truth is this. Jesus was crucified. He was entombed. He rose from the tomb, walked the earth, and was seen and spoke with probably 500 people of his day. Now, what is necessary for you to understand is that this was not true exclusively of Jesus, but that this is the truth about you. It was the truth about Jesus, beyond all question of doubt, and it is true that at least 500 people bore witness to that fact, but it is likewise true that you also will walk freely on earth after your so-called burial. The only difference is that there will not be 500 people identify you because you haven't asked them to expect you, to look for you, to believe in your powers of resurrection, and so they will turn away from your funeral with grief, believing you have gone somewhere. And according to their belief, so will it be unto them. But I speak to you from actual experience. The dead are never entombed in the grave. And uh, they are never cremated. That is only the shell, the carcass, the corpse, the body, the envelope. It is never then, because among many others, I have seen those who passed away standing in my presence and in some cases speaking to me. And I am not a person of imagination. Now, it is destined that we be immortal. For the offspring of God could not be less immortal than God. Call no man on earth your father, 
there is but one Father, the one in heaven. And therefore, you are not mortals. That is all that distinguishes the metaphysical and uh, mystical teachings from the materialistic orthodox religions. They believe that we are mortals. We know that we are immortals temporarily clothed upon with the belief handed down to us by our religious parents that we are mortals. In other words, we are clothed upon with mortality. And the Christian teaching, teaching tells us that we must be unclothed. We must remove from ourselves this false concept of self which says that we are mortals and be clothed upon with immortality. In other words, restore unto ourselves. Die daily to your mortality and be reborn into your immortality. And all of this as a process of consciousness. It is not a process of dying, being buried, and rising up again but the dying daily of the Christian teaching is a dying to the belief of your mortality, being unclothed of your mortality and being clothed upon with immortality. And all of this is a process of consciousness, of your consciousness. That is why I gave it to you last night as our first step in attaining the fourth dimensional or transcendental consciousness, please realize this, whatever takes place in your life will take place as an activity of your consciousness. It is not an activity of something external to you acting upon you for good or evil. It is an activity of consciousness within you and it will produce good or evil whether you sow to the flesh by treating yourself and others as if we are mortals or whether we treat each other as that which we are indeed sons of God, immortals. When we begin to look upon each other as that which we truly are, immortals, we will understand why we have no demonstration to make. We have no demonstration of supply to make, no demonstration of home, no demonstration of companionship, no demonstration over lack. We have only the demonstration of our divine sonship to make. And in that we will find we are heirs of God to all the heavenly riches. We, and this is the basic teaching of the infinite way, we have no demonstration to make except the demonstration of our divinity the demonstration of our divine sonship the demonstration of our oneness with God the demonstration of the realization of God's presence as Emmanuel or omnipresence once we attain this demonstration we can then be beholders and we can watch as all of a sudden our lives begin to change things appear in our outward world that never were there before things of harmony things of grace things of peace things of abundance to some extent we do not make a full and complete demonstration because we have tied ourselves to relatives and friends and we will not give them up. Therefore, we have to accept some of the limitations thrust upon us by their lack of demonstration. If each individual were a free individual, free of family, free of friends, free of business associates, free to make his or her own individual demonstration, there would then be no limit except the limit 
of their own ability to forsake the things of this world. That was what the master meant by you must leave mother and brother and sister. In one case, you must hate your mother and brother and sister. Of course, it does not mean literally hate them or throw them out of the house. But it does mean that until we can actually put every friend and every relative in their rightful place and say you have the same opportunity as I have for self-development, take it or leave it. But I am going forward. Those are harsh words. The disciples almost left the master for such words, but then they decided they had nowhere else to go. So it is that actually, go back to the first chapter of Genesis and learn that you were created in the image and likeness of God, and this is you. You are immortal being. Now, and this actually has been revealed in several religious uh, teachings, and uh, so it should not be strange to any of you in this age, you are spiritual beings. But as you come to a teaching of this kind, we are clothed with mortality. That is, we have taken upon ourselves the belief of being mortals, and we live that way. We live as if we had three score years and ten to look forward to, as if anybody had ever measured that out for us. And uh, we live as uh, if it's necessary to save up for a rainy day, because rainy days are inevitable. And so we adjust ourselves to the frame of mortality. And we look in the frame and see ourselves as mortals. Now, if you are to transcend that, and the purpose of your being in a teaching of this nature is the purpose of transcending that, you must do it within your consciousness. No one is going to do it for you. No one has the power to do it for you. This is something that must take place within you. The Master says, if I go not away, the Comforter cannot come to you. And so it is that if one individual transcends in some measure mortality and puts on a tiny measure of immortality so that they no longer see you as mortals, no longer believe that you are mortals, no longer treat you as mortals, but recognize your divine sonship, they can lift you out of many of your problems, sometimes overcome diseases for you or sins, often remove you from lack or limitation. But this is but a temporary thing that they can do for you because your life is going to be the outpicturing of your own state of consciousness. And therefore, if you remain in mortal consciousness, you will go right on demonstrating mortal consciousness. That is why you may have help from practitioners or teachers for five years or eight or ten or twelve and still be left in a state of mortality, just benefiting by their state of consciousness, and then wonder why, in the end, your life has not been made free of the world's discords. It is because your consciousness has not been changed from the mortal to the immortal. Now, this divine consciousness, this God consciousness, is universal, but it is also individual in that this is your consciousness, and in some degree, you demonstrate it. Then, before there is a man 
or woman on the face of the earth, there are crops in the ground. Before anyone can be here to plant the seed or to fertilize it, there are crops in the ground. In other words, consciousness appearing infinitely, consciousness appearing as infinite form, infinite variety, consciousness disclosing itself, revealing itself in every form necessary to our existence. Now, as we come to earth, immortals, this is back in the first chapter of Genesis, these crops continue to be perfect. These crops grow in spite of no sunshine, no rain, no planting of seeds, because they are the product of consciousness revealing itself, disclosing itself, manifesting itself. It is only when Adam and Eve are cast out of the Garden of Eden that crops begin to fail. Now, why was Adam and Eve cast out of the Garden of Eden? And don't believe all these stories you've been told about sex. That was a lot of mythology which was really not so much mythology as symbology. The actual truth behind it is they accepted the belief in good and evil. And that is why they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. They ate of the tree, of the fruit of the tree, of good and evil, of the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, we all eat that fruit when we have the knowledge of good and evil, when we have the knowledge of two powers. And do you not see now that at this moment of having two powers, you have a consciousness of two powers, and therefore everything that is an emanation of your consciousness is an emanation of two powers, sometimes good and sometimes evil. Do you not see now that everything that flows from your consciousness as a human being follows the pattern of being either good or evil or partaking of some measure of good and some measure of evil. Everything then that emanates from the mind of man partakes of the qualities of good and evil. Some things may be 90% good and 10% evil. Some things may be 90% evil and 10% good. Some things may be wholly good, perhaps, and some wholly evil. But the point is that the emanation of the mind of man, the expression of the mind of man, the manifestation of the mind of man partakes of the nature of good and evil, and so do his crops. And so then, while the crops will always grow, this is really the activity of divine consciousness, your crops and my crops will partake of the nature of your consciousness or my consciousness. Now, just to give you one illustration, one which is so well known that there is no possibility of anyone contradicting it, The Japanese, as a race, are the best flower and vegetable growers in the world. There is not even a, an iota of uh, doubt that no race comes even close to them in the raising of every kind of flower, plant, tree, and every kind of vegetable. Now they have the same ground because we in California had uh, a large population of Japanese farmers 
They have the same earth and they have the same fertilizers. In Hawaii, we have tremendous growers, Japanese growers of flowers, trees. And they have the same earth and they have the same fertilizer. But no one, absolutely no one, can grow flowers and vegetables as they do, produce such qualities as they do, produce such beauty as they do. One of the reasons is that as a race, the Japanese are very close to being nature mystics. That is about the term to give them, nature mystics. They see and feel God in every form of nature, whether it is a mountain or a valley, whether it is a lake, they are Mount Fujiyama, which you know is supposed to be a holy mountain. They have flower culture as a part of one of their great religions, and whole books are published on flower culture by religious means. And so you know that it is the purity of their nature consciousness that results in the purity of that which they grow. Now, in the materialistic point of view, if you give a man well acquainted with uh, farming, if you give him a good piece of fertile soil, and the right seeds and the right fertilizer, he'll certainly bring out a better crop for you than the neighbor whose soil is not as good or whose seeds are not as good or whose fertilizer is not as good. We have that again on a large scale in the states where the Florida citrus fruit is on the whole a far greater quality than the California. And the reason is that in Florida they pay so much attention to their soil and the fertilizing of it, and the maintaining of it, and in the proper fertilizing that they do grow better products. But into this does not enter the question that we have before us, and that is that given the same soil, the same seeds, the same fertilizer, the same amount of rain and sunshine, those of the purest consciousness will bring forth the best crop. And by purest consciousness, I mean the consciousness that has least belief in two powers, the consciousness that has the greatest degree of faith in the fact that since God is good, all power must be good, and that any other power has no place of operation in consciousness. Now then, on this basis, and here is the notation that I had made for tonight before ever seeing this question, it is the illumined state of our consciousness that performs the miracles of healing, not some consciousness or God separate from our own being, but our realized state of God consciousness. And this is true with crops. Now, in proportion then, as we have attained a realization of God as the only power in that degree, will our crops be better? And not only the crops in the gardens, but the crops in every walk of life, our business, art, profession, our marriages, our family life, our supply, all of this will be on a higher level of expression in proportion to the height of our realization and demonstration of God as individual consciousness, wholly good. Now, can you not see that where we have whole neighborhoods or whole communities or whole nations 
living in disobedience to spiritual principles that the crops in the entire community will not be up to the standard of what a crop should be. Not merely because the farmers are bad, insofar as any human sense of badness is concerned. As a matter of fact, they may even be good, according to human standards. But in being good, it merely means, well, I can answer you with Paul's statement, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything. Well, in order to be a good Hebrew, you must have had circumcision. So therefore, you could be perfectly good and have circumcision and have a bad crop. Because the fact of having been good according to a church rule does not mean you are good according to God. The only way that one can be good according to God is to recognize but one power, and that one spiritual. In other words, you could obey all of the Ten Commandments, except perhaps the first, and you could obey all the rules of your church and go to all its services and sing all of its hymns and still be bad spiritually. Because obedience to law has nothing to do with Christianity. You must come out from under the law. That is why Moses, I mean Jesus, set aside the Ten Commandments. It isn't going to avail you anything to obey those commandments. I'll tell you what it will avail you something to obey. The first commandment and the new commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and love thy neighbor as thyself. And this is spiritual integrity. This is spiritual goodness. And if you have that, you have no capacity to disobey the other nine commandments that you've thrown aside. In other words, it is like saying that if there were no laws in your nation against theft, if there were no laws with jail as a punishment, you still wouldn't steal. Why? How could you possibly have come this far on the spiritual path and not understand that loving thy neighbor as thyself means leaving his property alone? Whether his property is his wife or his home or his boat or his crops. And certainly you would know that in loving your neighbor as yourself, hands off everything that belongs to your neighbor and eyes off of it too. Then, if you are loving God supremely, you are understanding God as your supply, and you'd have abundance. And now, what difference does it make, even if they have no laws against theft? And that was what the Master was trying to convey. We need no laws against theft. We need no laws against murder. We need no laws against adultery. Why? If we are living in a love of God, if we are living in a love of our neighbor, how could we do to another what we would not have them do unto us? And thereby, we would be living in the same atmosphere in which we are living here in this room. It sounded strange, I know, Sunday morning. I was talking to 30 men in Dartmoor prison. And uh, I said, I, I'm not here to teach and I'm not here to preach. And I didn't come here to get something. In fact, there isn't anything you've got that I want. And they laughed. <laughs> Thinking, of course, it's pretty good for you to feel that way. But I could say the same thing right here. There is nothing that you have that I want because... In living this life of conscious union with God, everything is provided at every moment of every day of which I could possibly have a need. And more than that, I certainly do not want. All right, then. In that consciousness, we don't have to have any laws of 
thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not envy. How can you envy anyone anything that you can have if you have any need of it just by your relationship to God, not by working for it, not by inheriting it, not by deserving it, but by reason of your relationship to God, which is sonship, divine sonship. So it is then that as evil as this world appears to be today, we have far more crops than anyone needs. And I can tell you that if man's evil nature could destroy those crops, we'd be without crops today, judging from most of the nature that is being exhibited on earth. But as you well notice, crops are abundant almost everywhere where they are planted. Certainly there is lack and limitation in China, in India. Of course, they have never developed the uh, agricultural ability. They have never gone beyond. I have seen in India farm wagons without wheels. They still are not using wheels on their carts in some parts of India. They have a horse hitched up to a great big plank and things are placed on that plank and the horse hauls them without even the benefit of a little wheel. Think of that and then you'll understand why they have a lack of food. And that's only symbolic because all the way up the line they are definitely without modern means of farming except what has been added to them under their present administration. And of course they have made great progress. But taken as a nation, they are far behind the rest of the world, so is China, in the development of foods. Go to Japan and you find abundance, but you'll also find that every piece of ground is utilized for growing of food, even along the railroad tracks right up to the tracks. Nobody wastes uh, an inch of ground in Japan. If there's a space there big enough, as big as the top of this table, be assured it has something growing on it, something either for food or beauty. And uh, they have developed along modern lines. So therefore, most of the development of foods, plants, trees, flowers, is dependent merely on nature and uh, modern farming skills. But to go beyond that, you have to come into this realm of the spiritual and begin to understand that those individuals who are living most nearly in the realization of God as omnipresence, Emmanuel, are bringing forth the greater crops. And they will sometimes bring forth three ears of corn where another brings forth two. I witnessed an experience of that in Massachusetts when uh, a man, a Christian scientist, bought a dairy herd from a man who was not able to make it pay. There just was not enough milk produced to keep the proposition on a paying basis. And this Christian scientist, by nothing more than the addition of his uh, spiritual awareness, not only had it paying within a few months, but within a year had a very profitable enterprise and was showing more than a 20% increase in the output of milk per cow. And not through material means, but through his recognition of supply as spiritual. Of course, you can multiply this a million times around the earth wherever there is an individual with any degree of understanding of God as the primal substance, God as the multiplier, God as the activity of all formation, you will have somebody bringing forth more business, more crops, more harmony than elsewhere. The same thing is true 
in teaching. I have had the experience of working with school teachers. Now, one of the experiences that I had was this, also in Massachusetts, where a school teacher had not had the benefit of spiritual teaching and then came to me and had a year of continuous instruction. And one of the things that I first said to her was that you are responsible for what takes place in your classroom. Now, in uh, uh, Massachusetts, in January, February, and March, there is a tremendous absence from school because of colds, grip, and flu. Those are three bad months in Massachusetts, and I think March is probably the worst of them. But <clears throat> I told her that that need not be in her room. Also, every term, a certain amount of students are left back because they have not passed their examinations and uh, cannot be promoted. This, I told her, was within her control. And at the end of a year, this teacher had 5% absences during those months instead of the school's average of 23%. And she had no children left back at the end of her terms instead of whatever the figure had been before. And incidentally, that school teacher eventually became the traveling representative for the entire state, traveling the whole world, learning educational methods for the state of Massachusetts rising up from just a classroom teacher to one of the highest positions in education in the entire estate just by the proof of what she had done in her classrooms. Why? Because a classroom is not a material place and children aren't human beings and there aren't ch good children and bad children and there aren't sick children and well children. There are sons of God daughters of God, children of God. There are immortals, not mortals, and there are not two powers operating, the power of weather and the power of climate, overcoming the power of God. There is only the power of God. And this truth in your consciousness becomes a law unto your business, your body, your home, your classroom, your farm. This is the entire basis of the mystical living. This is the entire basis of spiritual living that since God is consciousness and God is your consciousness, your life is the emanation of your particular state of that pure consciousness. And the closer you come to living the life of one power, the closer you come to having harmony in every walk of your life. We in this work must give up the universal belief that there are forces working against us that prevent the harmony in our experience. We must give up the belief that someone else is responsible for our lack of demonstration. It is true, as I said before, that in some measure we knowingly hold back our demonstration. For instance, if an individual had an income, we will just say of uh, 25 pounds, and uh, they had two or three or four sick relatives or unemployed ones that they had to take care of, by virtue of taking care of them, they would interfere with their own demonstration temporarily, but that would not permanently be a fact because very quickly it would be realized that these members of one's family really were children of God and therefore that God's care of his own children did not deplete my income and therefore one of two things would happen they either would become sufficiently independent 
as to get along or else my income would increase enough to be able to take care of them and still not interfere with my demonstration. In other words, eventually each one of us becomes a law unto himself. Eventually, and that is the goal of this work, not permitting ourselves to be victimized, but rather to believe that a thousand can fall at my left and ten thousand at my right, but it cannot come nigh my dwelling place. Or eventually to believe the master in the 15th chapter of John, as long as I live in this word and let this word live in me, I am one with the vine. Therefore, I am living not by virtue of might or by power. I am living because of my oneness with the vine, with God, with the infinite source, with the source of life, with the fountain of life, with the life stream. And I am fed, clothed, housed by this stream of spiritual life of which I am but the emanation and expression. Now, this makes each one of us a law unto ourselves because if we are in the schoolroom, we are saying, this too is the child of God, under the law of God, and there are no material or mental laws interfering with the harmonious operation of this room and all those therein. And in business, we would adopt the same attitude. This business is the temple of God. It is fed not by the banks and not by customers. It is fed by my consciousness. My consciousness maintains and sustains this business. My consciousness of God's presence maintains and sustains this business. My conscious union with God makes this business supported, maintained, and sustained by God. And so it is that we move from my body, my home, my family, my business, my school, my art, my profession, and find that all of these are spiritually created, spiritually endowed, spiritually governed by my consciousness because they are in and of my consciousness. This is a spiritual universe and you are not in it. It is within you. Your form is within your consciousness. Your crops are within your consciousness. Your schoolroom is within your consciousness. Your gift or talent, music, art, whatever it may be, is within your consciousness. Your home is within your consciousness. Your family is within your consciousness. And God is your consciousness. Therefore, as long as you abide in the realization of God constituting your being, then God constitutes your business and your home and your body and your schoolroom. Now, this is, without doubt, a most important point. You do not use God power because that would be acknowledging two powers. And the whole goal of our work is not going back to orthodoxy and believing that there is a God fighting the devil and losing out 99 times out of 100. But our realization transcends anything like that. Our realization is that since God is infinite, since God is omnipotence, Nothing that claims to have power is power. Why do you think the master could be bold enough to say, resist not evil, put up thy sword? Why don't you know that if evil was a power, 
The master would have been the first one to teach us how to use the power of God over evil. Or he would have given us a weapon or a defense against evil. But actually he stripped us of defenses against evil when he said, put up thy sword, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And when he said, resist not evil. Why? The mystery is this. And don't try to tell this to a materialist. But the mystery is this. God is omnipotence. And God is omnipresence. And because God is here where I am and is the only power, I need not resist any appearance of evil. That is the mystery of Daniel's going into the lion's den. That is the mystery of Daniel, who ate less than all of the other prisoners, and yet was the only one whose body and health remained perfect. That is the mystery of the master saying to Pilate, Thou couldst have no power over me unless it came from God. So go ahead and crucify me, and I'll show you that I will walk the earth again. For I cannot be killed even by crucifixion. And of course, you cannot be killed by disease or by accident or by old age. And if for a moment this universal belief thinks it can do that unto you, it can only succeed if you accept two powers, if you do not live up to your transcendental teaching. Now, I do not say that because spiritual truth is truth, that you can just defy evil. Not at all. You must be born again. You must come to spiritual discernment. And that is where time is the element. That is why, although many, in fact, I suppose all of the students who uh, remain with us from the time of their coming for years and years afterward, it is undoubtedly because some measure of harmony, some measure of good comes into their experience right from the start. But that in no wise testifies to their spiritual development. It probably testifies to their practitioners or their teachers. It is only as they begin to develop this consciousness of oneness, of one power, and of resisting not evil, that the harmonies begin to appear as a result of their own spiritual growth. And I have observed this, that the most spiritually prepared student still requires three or four or five years before their material state of consciousness has lessened enough to make them a transparency for spiritual good. And some who are slower, and I was one of those slower ones, it takes longer than three or four or five years. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to suffer all those years. We can get some measure of help from practitioners and teachers who will work with us as long as we work faithfully, conscientiously with them. But the Master says it is the straight and narrow path and few there be that enter only because they cannot wait patiently for the change of consciousness, the transition in consciousness that makes them a transparency for the presence and power of God. There are many, many people who wonder about the progress of the infinite way in 14 years, having encircled the globe, having found wonderful publishing houses in the United States and England, Germany, Switzerland, Holland, now Japan. Why it is that the work is so beautifully established and I'm able to keep going around the world year in and year out. Many wonder about it. 
But they do not realize that before I ever took a student, I practiced healing work for 16 years and waited for these specific principles to evolve, to be proved, to be demonstrated, so that since the first Infinite Way book was written, not a word of principle has been changed. The only editing that has been done is in, uh, we call it cleaning it up, making uh, better formation of chapters, chapter headings, better divisions of the books, clarifying some of the uh, mistakes in punctuation and so forth that got into the early rough printings before there was any editing done. But aside from that, not a word of any principle has been changed since the first book. And why? Because after 16 years of proving principles, you have the principles pretty well established in their correctness. You have seen the demonstration of it, and you can then begin to teach. So it is. These principles have been proven not only in that first 16 years, but now in the 14 years that have gone by since then, making over 30 years. And uh, this is room for a lot of confidence on our part in uh, the rightness of the principles. Now, see this point that in your work of bringing harmony into your body, into your business, into your home, into your family, don't go around searching for a God power. Abide confidently at the center of your being in the realization that God power already is by virtue of omnipresence, Emmanuel. God power already is, and besides this there is no power, and this power of God is not a far off. It is actually closer to you than breathing. Actually, it is where you are. That's the meaning of omnipresence. That is the meaning of Emmanuel, God with us. Here and now, where I am, God is. I don't have to make it so. And never do I have to beg God, implore God, try to influence God. Never do I have to ask God or demand of God. I merely have to realize God is. Because of omnipresence, God is. Because of Emmanuel, God is. Here where I am, God is. And God is all there is since God is infinite. And rest in that word and then watch how the enemy fights among themselves and destroys themselves. As long as you stand back as a beholder, not a wielder of power, not as if God had given you some special privilege or power to use in the world, but rather because God itself is the power and operates in you, through you, as you. And all you have to do is stand by and watch it at work. Just as when you switch on these lights at the switch, the light comes on. All you have to do is watch the light come on because the electricity is doing the work. And so it is. God constitutes your consciousness and God is doing the work and you are a beholder watching the glory of God, watching the sun rise and set, watching the tides come in and out, watching the crops grow, watching the fruit grow on the trees, watching the flowers on the bushes, watching the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, watching, being a beholder of God's glory being made manifest. And so you'll find that in uh, this great power of non-power, the non-use of the power, you have the only power there is. This is a deep point. It is so deep that although it is the essence of the Master's teaching, it has never been embraced 
in any Christian teaching. And yet it is the essence of his teaching. Ye need not fight. Put up thy sword. Resist not evil. Thou couldst have no power over me. What did hinder you? Pick up your bed and walk. Blind man, open thine eyes. No power. No power. And even at Lazarus' tomb, he says, I need not pray. Just Lazarus, come forth. Why? There's no other power here but life. And so it is. You can see why it takes time. We have to make a transition from using power. We have to make a transition from resisting evil. So that the minute somebody says, cancer, polio, that we don't all of a sudden rise up on our mental legs and start battling. And that takes time. It takes time to develop the state of consciousness that can say, what did hinder you? Thou could have no power. Well, this is really wonderful, isn't it? Two such nights. Thank you.